The advertising messages in this episode are brought to you by Breast Cancer Index, the first and only test recognized by professional oncology guidelines to predict benefit from extended endocrine therapy in early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Can you identify the 95% of women who don't benefit from extending anti-estrogen therapy from five to 10 years? Breast Cancer Index can help. To learn more, visit breastcancerindex.com forward slash ONS. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS, and today we're talking with ONS member Elizabeth Bentoncourt, Oral Oncolytic Nurse Navigator at Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Sunnyvale, California, and member of the Silicon Valley ONS chapter to discuss the current picture of oral adherence to cancer therapies, the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on adherence, and ONS's guideline recommendations for oral adherence. You can also earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks for joining me today, Elizabeth. You're very welcome. I'm very excited to share what I have learned over the years. Great. You know, as we all know, therapy for patients who have a cancer diagnosis has changed tremendously over the years. With the advances of oral therapies have really brought challenges with that. While we thought, wow, how wonderful patients don't have to be in the hospital, they're not attached to an IV pole, and those types of things, we've really come to see that there are other challenges that we face with patients who are receiving oral therapies. So one of those, or maybe the most important challenge that we experience with patients is related to oral adherence. To start us off, can you explain oral adherence and why that is so important? Yeah, so oral adherence implies, in general, actually following the ordered dosing schedule that's ordered by the provider. And it's important because adhering to a particular plan or not adhering to a particular plan can actually affect the treatment outcome. In other words, if a patient's not following the dosing schedule, then we're not going to see the outcome that we had hoped for in the beginning. But adherence is really quite a complex process, and I think we will get into the complexity of that as we continue on this discussion. Okay, then let's talk a little bit about what the nurse's role in supporting patients with oral adherence is. So nurses have a really unique position in supporting patients. They work side by side with the ordering provider. They're an intricate part of the care team. They have that connection and a relationship they've established with the patient since the patient's diagnosis. Nurses excel in assessment skills. They excel in symptom management. And they're able to assess a patient before starting a medication like this to determine if they're ready to start an oral oncolytic treatment. What are their social and financial statuses? Can they swallow the pills? Can they access food and transportation? Can they get to the laboratory to have blood work done on a regular basis? Can they get their echoes and EKGs and what other monitoring is required? Again, nurses excel in symptom management and managing symptoms is essential in helping patients to continue to adhere to their treatment regimen. Again, the nurse is in a unique position because they've been working with that patient. They developed this relationship from the day the patient was diagnosed throughout the many years of the care, whether it's through the end of life or until they finish treatment. So nurses have this unique connection that's going to allow them to learn and know about their patient. And a patient trusts that relationship and they're much more open and willing to talk to a nurse about some of their lack of support or needs, things that they need in order to adhere to a particular plan. I can't agree with you more on that. I think that 
we as nurses really do have a special relationship with our patients and they confide in us in a lot of things. So they may be speaking with their physician about what this new therapy is and treatment and they go and find out more about it from the pharmacy or something like that and come back and start talking to us about what their concerns are. And I think that's so important to recognize that we have that ability to work with our patients in that way. So in regards to that, what other members of the interdisciplinary team support patients through oral adherence? Oral adherence is a very complex issue, and here's some of the complexity we come into. It's not just the physician, the nurse, and the provide and the patient. Adherence involves pharmacy staff, social workers, financial support, the person in the pharmacy that helps to schedule all the refills. So, pharmacy plays an important role. I mean, they are connecting with that patient, hopefully with every refill that they ship out to a patient. So they have the ability to maybe come across some issues that have been going on for that particular patient and relay it to the provider team so we can follow up. Social workers can be involved to assist patients with getting needs outside of their actual oral cancer treatment. Do they need transportation? Do they need access to food? Are they homeless? Do they need a place where they can get these medications delivered? Those types of things a social worker is great at helping out with. Financial counselors come in and helping patients afford their medication. Um, I think a lot of us already know how important this role is in supporting patients getting copay assistance grants or copay discount cards. And we have to remember when you're on an oral cancer medication, it's not a limited time for many of these patients. This is something that goes on year after year as long as the drug is working. So even a co-payment of $30 a month can be quite significant when you look at having to pay that over the course of five, six years. So the financial counselors play a really big role as well. I kind of see this issue as the nurse is kind of the hub of a spoked wheel. And then you have your pharmacy and your provider all on the outside edge, but it's the nurse that's connecting all of these different support services together and being the main connection for the patient. It's so important to know who all of those players are as we're working with our patients and are trying to get them connected with the right folks. Definitely. So you mentioned the pharmacy and pharmacists. How can the type of pharmacy a patient uses affect their treatment? We basically have two types. We will have an in-house pharmacy. So that's a care organization that has their own dispensing pharmacy. And the advantage of that is that these dispensing pharmacies usually can get drugs much faster to the patient. For a lot of places, the pharmacy might be local, so a patient can actually go there. We don't have to deal with delivery services. If they're not local, then, of course, the pharmacy will deliver meds to the patient. This in-house pharmacy staff usually will have a direct connection with the prescribing provider's office and care team, and this helps to resolve issues quickly. The other type of pharmacy is like an insurance contracted pharmacy. Because these entities are a separate business from the actual healthcare team, it can take longer to get the drug to the patient. It can be a little more difficult for communication to occur between the two businesses. You know, the pharmacy may send you a fax, it takes a while to get to you, or the fax doesn't come through. It takes time to get on the phone and communicate with these pharmacies. So the communication delay can actually affect how quickly a patient can get a medication. The difficulty for the patient is you're now introducing another third-party person that is working with them to get their medication. The patients have difficulties with navigating the phone trees to get to the person they need to at the particular pharmacy. They don't recognize the phone number of this pharmacy. Now, I'm on the West Coast. Most of these specialty pharmacies are out in the Midwest and the East Coast. So patients don't recognize the number. They don't answer the call. They get frustrated with being on hold for a long time. And all of these issues can delay how quickly a patient can get their initial fill or their future refills. And then another issue with the insurance contracted pharmacies is that insurances tend to change they are contracted pharmacy fairly frequently, maybe once a year or once every two years. And so that introduces another third party 
to the patient to have to work with in order to continue getting their medication. So again, it's very complex. And I personally, in my role, find myself again as that hub on this spoked wheel, trying to connect all of these different dots to make sure that the patient is getting the drug that they need at the right time. So Elizabeth, in thinking about a patient who is on an oral therapy, and you were just talking about the pharmacy and how they might receive their medication, how is it that a nurse would guide or help a patient make the decision of what type of pharmacy they're getting that from. You mentioned the in-house versus insurance contracted. If it is an insurance contracted pharmacy, is that, I'm going to say mandated, but that might not be the right word, but regulated by the insurance of where they have to go? Yeah, for the most part, it is regulated by the insurance on what pharmacy is utilized, except for patients with Medicare D. I usually obtain what pharmacy to use when the prior authorization is obtained. It'll usually tell you at that time, this drug is approved, but you need to use this particular pharmacy. So if a prior auth identifies a pharmacy, then you really have no choice, but you need to use that pharmacy. There are some exceptions to this rule, and those are the drugs that are limited distribution drug, where they may be limited to two or three or four pharmacies nationwide. And then knowing that, I will send that prescription to that particular pharmacy who will then get the override from the insurance company to dispense that particular medication. You can find that information most on the website for those particular drugs. They will usually give you a list if it's a limited distribution drug, which pharmacies can dispense it. When you have Medicare D, you can really use any pharmacy unless you have like an advantage plan where you might be limited to a contracted pharmacy. So I usually give an offer to a patient. We are connected in my clinic with one particular specialty pharmacy. I will start there. But if the patient has a preference, you know, let's say they, I use Walgreens, they use CVS, then I will transfer it to CVS. And so that's how I determine which pharmacy to use. Most of that comes from the prior authorization. Thank you for explaining that. I think we have listeners who are new to oncology, so it's good for those folks to know and understand how that might work. So I mentioned at the beginning that patients who are on oral therapies, you know, there are a lot of challenges or barriers that they might face. So can you talk a little bit about what some of those barriers might be when they're trying to obtain as well as adhering to oral anti-cancer drugs? There are quite a few, actually. I think the big thing up front that most of us are very familiar is drug cost issues and delays in getting insurance approval. Those are challenges that, you know, the patient can't do a whole lot about until we get through to the prior auth and we get the appeal approved. And then we find out, oh, you know, you're going to have to pay a couple thousand dollars for your drug and the patient can't afford it. Then we have to go through that process of trying to get them copay assistance. And, you know, that's a very stressful time for a patient who wants to get started on treatment right away. So it's important to support them. It's most important to let them know what is going on. I make a point regularly throughout this process. When I first speak with a patient, I explain to them the complexity of this. I let them know, you know, this is not a drug you're going to get tomorrow. It's going to take up to 10 days to two weeks. There could be some cost issues. So it's important for the person who's communicating with that patient to know about all of these different facets of this complexity of obtaining medication. The other challenge and barrier for patients is connecting with these particular dispensing pharmacies. And patients do get frustrated when they get generic phone calls from a pharmacy saying one of those robot calls, oh, I have your, your medicine is ready, but it doesn't say what the medicine is. The patient has no idea and they don't call back. And, you know, three days later, then the pharmacy is calling me and I call the patient. So, Again, information to the patient, letting them know what's going on is going to help overcome these particular barriers. Refills, again, same process as trying to make sure refill prescriptions get to the pharmacy in time so patients are getting their refills in time. That can prevent a barrier for a patient to continue taking the medication. And then the other part of this is side effects and the complexity of the treatment, how many pills they have to take. Are they getting a combination treatment? And is it IV with oral? These all prevent barriers to a patient to continue taking treatment. 
what kind of support do they have at home? Do they have a home? Do they have someone at home that can remind them to take the pills if they need that? Someone at home to help get the delivery of the drug into the house. These are all challenges that affect the patient's ability to continue to being adhered to a particular treatment plan. Patients get confused. When you have so many multiple people involved in this process and they're getting multiple phone calls from the pharmacy, from the social worker, from the doctor's office, from the scheduler at the pharmacy, they get overwhelmed and they don't know who's in charge and they start to lose faith in, you know, is this really going to happen? And some people actually think, well, maybe this drug isn't so serious since it seems like so many people are doing so many different things. So again, communication is key in the very beginning and during treatment to ensure that patients have what they need so they can be adherent to these treatment plans. How can oncology nurses help patients to overcome these barriers that you were mentioning? So I've talked a lot that nurses have the ability to assess patients ahead of time, make sure that they're ready to start this treatment. But a really important facet is once they've started treatment is proactive follow-up. And by that, I mean, don't wait for the patient to call you. You call them. Call them on a regular basis. I have been doing this for over 12 years, and my standard is to call a patient within the first five to seven days. Number one, I'm reinforcing the dosing schedule, making sure they're taking it the right way. I'm reinforcing side effects. I'm preparing them for what they might start to experience in the, as the weeks go on. And then I continue that follow-up at least weekly for another three to four weeks, depending on the patient and the drug. But I would say the majority of patients, this is our standard. And by doing that, we are able to assess side effects quickly and maybe support a patient to manage those side effects and have them continue on treatment. What I have found in my experience is when we educate patients about the potential side effects of treatment, as they get into that third, four week, all of a sudden they're on a drug and they wake up in the morning and they have a rash. And what do they say? Oh, Elizabeth told me a side effect was a rash, so I don't need to worry about the rash. But by my proactive phone call of that patient that week and the patient says, oh yeah, I got a rash two days ago. And because of that proactive call, I'm able to jump on it, manage that rash and keep them on treatment. So I think proactive follow-up is essential to help patients overcome barriers to adhering to their treatment plan. Excellent. Thank you. Those are great tips for the nurses who are seeing patients that are on these oral anti-cancer drugs. So let's talk a little bit about patient adherence and with the types of treatments that they're on. I'm sure that as you sort of alluded to earlier, that these treatments are complex. They're not always just one thing. And the patients have a lot of things that they're having to remember. So the complexity of these treatments, how does that impact a patient being inherent to their treatment regimen? Well, the more complex the treatment, the more difficult it is to adhere. So if you have a patient who's taking a drug for a couple of weeks and then has a week off, but then they're also getting an IV treatment and they're getting that once a week or twice a week, that complexity makes it extremely difficult for the patient to figure out what am I supposed to do on these particular days? When do I take the drug? When do I stop the drug? Or there's a delay in their treatment. And then that increases the complexity because now, well, when do I restart? Do I restart taking the full three weeks and then a week off? Or do I finish the weeks I missed? That increases the complexity. The other part of complexity is how many pills they have to take. Prime example is capsidabine. Many times patients are taking three or four pills of one strength and two or three pills of another strength. They may be taking one dose in the morning and and a different dose in the evening, which just increases that complexity of how to stay on treatment plan and make sure I'm taking the right drug at the right time. Again, proactive follow-up continued follow-up with these patients and reinforcing that dosing schedule can help patients stay on treatment and adhere to that particular plan. Great. The advertising messages in this episode are brought to you by Breast Cancer Index, joint pain and hot flashes. 
mood swings, and weight gain. Breast cancer patients on anti-estrogen therapy know all about the side effects, which is why the decision of whether to stop therapy at five years or to continue through 10 is so vital for so many women. Breast Cancer Index is the guideline recognized genomic assay for evaluating the duration of anti-estrogen therapy a modern predictive tool that removes the guesswork, validates decision-making, and improves patient compliance. Breast Cancer Index, the modern guideline for extended endocrine therapy. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the COVID-19 pandemic's effect on oral adherence for cancer therapies. What additional barriers did this create for patients and their adhering to their treatment regimens? These are barriers that will probably continue on because I think COVID has kind of changed the face of the delivery of healthcare, especially with the development of telehealth or video health, you know, video visits and telephone calls instead of actual in person communication. COVID restricted patients' ability to come into the office. So we don't have that face to face like we used to have as much. Some patients have lost employment. They've lost health insurance, which has affected their ability to access medication. They may have had a drug interruption while we were trying to find them copay assistance or work with the manufacturer to help them get drug that they can no longer obtain. Having patients not coming into the office has made it challenging. You know, patients have been unwilling to go to the laboratory because there's a line at the lab and people don't want to be exposed. So they're not doing their blood tests. They're not having their other monitoring requirements done, such as echoes and EKGs. There might not be staff in the actual healthcare facility to support the availability of getting these tests, which has affected patients' ability to keep on track with their monitoring parameters. For my particular facility and from what I hear nationwide, educating our patients has dramatically changed. We used to do it all in person. Now we are doing most of it over the phone, at least in my facility. I know other facilities are doing video visits for education. I myself have had to learn to use technology in order to send electronic education material to patients. We're sending education material in the mail to patients, hoping that they have that available when we talk to them. And then I'll have to have a phone call with them in order to provide all the education that I would normally have done in person. And this is challenging, especially for elderly patients that don't have access to technology, don't understand the technology very well. And so it can be very challenging for elderly patients, patients without technology, in order to meet their needs to provide what they need to adhere to their treatment plan. Yes, things have definitely changed. And those are such good examples of how we have adapted and we have worked with the patients to adapt during this time. Like you mentioned, there are certain populations though that it has continued to be a struggle with just due to the availability of technology and whether it's that they don't have access to it or don't understand how it's used. So the ONS guidelines to support patient adherence to oral anti-cancer therapy provides evidence-based recommendations for patients who are prescribed oral anti-cancer medications. Can you tell us a little bit more about those guidelines and what they recommend? Yes, these guidelines provide evidence-based recommendations to support adherence. And what the panel determined is that there really is no standard of care in the management of adherence for patients on cancer medication. We developed a couple of topics that we tried to focus on and looked at what evidence helps to support these particular recommendations that we came up with. We talked about things like using a risk assessment to determine a patient status before they start treatment. We talked about whether a formal education was a better way to treat these patients. We didn't have a standard of care to really compare these with, and we found that there isn't a body of evidence out there to support a lot of these things that we're trying to put in place. What we have found is that, yes, a formal program for managing patients is a good recommendation. The support for education and formal education 
types of tools that we need to support these patients, such as motivational interviewing and coaching interviewing techniques. And again, having a formal program is something that we need to look at in a standard of practice in order to help everyone manage our patients effectively. I'm sure that that's extremely helpful for nurses to have those guidelines and recommendations. So can you talk to us a little bit about what is ONS's oral anti-cancer medication toolkit and how a new oncology nurse can use it in practice? So the toolkit has actually been around for many years. I actually started, came across that maybe eight years ago. This toolkit provides some basic structure for a new nurse who's looking at how am I going to manage these patients on oral chemo. It will give you guidelines on what you as the nurse should know, the things that you need to track, the things you need to monitor. It gives you some guidelines to help you set up a program to monitor your patients from before they start treatment, while they're on treatment, and until they finish treatment. I have personally have used this toolkit to work with my upper management to help support the program that I've developed. And I'm hoping in the same way that the new guideline, the ONS guidelines to support patient adherence can be utilized in the same way to show your management, look, you know, this is the recommendation of the experts out there. We really want to get this type of thing set up for our particular program. Are there some opportunities for nurse scientists and other researchers to build the evidence for care of patients who are prescribed oral anti-cancer medications? Yes, I think that we can look at, number one, we need evidence to support a formal program for patients on oral anti-cancer medications. If you think about the past, when we had our patients in the clinic, there's really a big structure on how patients coming into the clinic to get their intravenous or sub-Q chemotherapy and how that patient is assessed prior, during, and after their treatment. There's a lot of work that goes in beforehand, and there's a lot of work that goes on after. Oral anti-cancer treatment is the same thing, and we have to reinforce that we need to have the same process for managing these patients on oral oncolytic medication. And I think that we need to ensure even more of a structured and formal program for these patients. From my personal experience, my husband back in 2006 was diagnosed with GIST and during his year and a half of life, he was on five different oral oncolytic medications. Now, this was way back when, before we had the volume of medications we had now, and we didn't know about the types of programs we had. And we had no education and no support. We really didn't think of these drugs as chemotherapy. We just thought, oh, it's a prescription you have to take. And so we've made great strides moving forward to ensure that our patients that are given this prescription get the follow-up and the care that they need. And I strongly feel this is where we need more researchers to support these types of programs. These types of programs require staffing, and it's not the kind of staffing that generates a lot of income for healthcare facilities, except that this is where the evidence can come in. If we can show that our programs are helping patients stay out of the hospital, we're helping patients stay on treatment, we're managing side effects, and they're having great treatment outcomes. And if the research can show us that that's going to help support in management eyes that these programs are effective and they should become the standard of care. I think other areas of research are what types of education is effective, what type of follow-up is effective. One of the recommendations in the guidelines is for proactive follow-up and research in that showing that proactive follow-up is supporting patients and oral adherence and improving the ultimate outcome for these patients, which is effective treatment outcome. A lot of work that needs to be done so that we can continue to improve patient care and patient outcomes, definitely. So Elizabeth, this has been really wonderful talking with you today and we're coming to the end of the podcast. I like to finish all of our podcasts with a few questions and I'm just gonna ask them in a real rapid fire manner. The first one that I have for you is, what are some common misconceptions about oral adherence? 
for a lot of people, they just think oral adherence is taking the drug. And as we've discussed in this this conversation we've had, it's a very complex issue. It's not just the patient and the doctor. There are multiple facets that come into play and multiple staff that help to ensure that this process occurs. I think one thing we didn't talk about, there are two types of oral adherence, and there is over-adherence versus under-adherence. Under-adherence is the one most people think about when they talk about adherence, and that's a patient not taking the drug and missing doses. But there's also over-adherence, and I referenced this in a patient who had a rash and said, this is an expected side effect, so I'm going to keep taking the drug and not call the doctor's office. Well, that's an over-adherence of a patient taking the drug the way they're supposed to with side effects that continue to get worse and worse. And So that's an important concept to remember when we're dealing with adherence. It's a very complex. We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can to support all these different facets to ensure the patient is getting quality care. Excellent. What is something about oral adherence to cancer therapies that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? A lot of people talk about oral adherence in the very beginning of treatment. However, as we all know, the longer you are on a medication, the more likely you're going to become non-adherent to your treatment plan as the years go on. A lot of patients on oral anti-cancer therapy are on drugs for the rest of their life or for extended periods of time. And so the necessity to ensure adherence throughout their course of treatment is just as important in the beginning and just as important throughout the course of their treatment to ensure that two years down the line, we still have a patient who's getting their refills on time, who's taking the drugs the way they're supposed to, who's not become lazadaisical as a, not a negative word, but We all do this when you take a drug more and more often. You go, oh, I missed a dose here or there, no big deal. Oh, I'm going on a trip for two days. I'm not going to take my drug with you. That's just human nature. And it's important to reinforce with patients that, no, we need to keep doing that. And the only way we can do that is by being proactive and following up with these patients on a regular basis throughout the course of their treatment. Really good idea. What are some additional training or resources that oncology nurses need to support their patients' adherence to oral anti-cancer medications? I think for me, over the course of these 12 years that I've been an oral oncolytic nurse navigator, understanding insurance coverage, I think, is extremely important. That's not something we are routinely trained in as nurses, but I have found it invaluable for me to know how insurances cover drugs, especially Medicare D, because as you know, we're the ones who end up essentially explaining this to patients when they call you and say, oh, the pharmacy said I have to pay $3,000. And so you have to explain how that works. I mean, I've had to take extra steps to learn this and understand how it works. And that's training I think nurses in this particular role are going to need to find help with to understand it. Also understanding how the pharmacies work. Every pharmacy is different. You know, if you have in-house, learn the intricacies of that pharmacy. What do the different staff members do? When you have an issue, who do you call? Try and get a primary contact person in that pharmacy to make your communication more effective. When you're dealing with specialty pharmacies that are contracted with insurance company, every pharmacy is different on how they manage refills, how they interact with the patient. So learning how these pharmacies work and getting a contact for every pharmacy has been key for me to keep my communication open and to get issues resolved. Lastly, what are some additional resources for patients and providers who might want to learn more about oral adherence? ONS, of course, is coming out with great literature and has become a big advocate of trying to get some more research and literature out there to help support providers and staff. The ONS Toolkit excellent resource for someone trying to set up a program and to justify to their management the use of a program. Now we have the ONS guidelines to support. There's an organization called ENCODA, which works specifically on patients with oral oncolytics. There are some other resources out there to help with education. We've got the Oral Chemo Ed Sheets website, which provides patient education material specific to the oral oncolytic medication. But again, more literature, more research is needed, and I am grateful and happy to see that these things are starting to come into place as the years go on. 
Elizabeth, again, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been a real pleasure and I can just hear your passion for working with patients who are on oral anti-cancer medications and how important it is to work with them to maintain that adherence and their treatment regimen. Do you have any final comments for us today? I'd like to say that I've been in oncology now for almost 35 years, and I've really done a little bit of everything, but I have found this role of working with patients on oral oncolytic medication to be my most rewarding. And it's because of that long-term connection I have with my patients, I'm able to help them in all facets of their life as they continue on their oral cancer drugs, keep them on treatment, have effective treatment. We just develop such a unique relationship that it's very rewarding to be able to help my patients every day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS. The advertising messages in this episode were brought to you by Breast Cancer Index, the only guideline recognized test for extended endocrine therapy. Go beyond traditional clinicopathologic factors with the only tool validated to inform decisions about extending anti-estrogen therapy from five to 10 years. When 95% don't benefit from extending, 100% of women deserve to know. To learn more, visit breastcancerindex.com forward slash ONS.